times sure have changed, haven't they? But did you know that the Bible says that times are going to change even more? But the good news is the Bible teaches us how we can have hope for the future. We began a new Bible study series here at Tates Creek Baptist Church through the book of Daniel. And we're glad you've joined us. Now let's go in the auditorium for today's message. As you know, we're going through at this time the book of Daniel and we have made it to the fifth chapter of Daniel, a very important chapter as we study the book of Daniel. Of course, Daniel is one of those thrilling books that gives to us a message every time we read one of its verses. And chapter 5 is nonetheless a powerful message for us as we see again God do something very unusual and present a message to Daniel in a very unusual way uh, as we read in chapter 5. And as you, as you get into chapter 5, you'll notice a new name here. You'll notice that now verse 1 mentions King Belshazzar. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute, haven't we been saying Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon? Well, some things have happened since we left chapter 4 and the events of chapter 4. It's not like a fellow that came to me today after I preached and he said, you know, your dad and I have the same first name. I said, oh, your first name's Ralph? He said, no, it's Don. Okay. You help me to understand how that's the same name. But anyway, we're not talking about the same guy when we're talking about King Belshazzar and King Nebuchadnezzar. What has happened is between the events of what we studied in the first four chapters until now being in chapter 5 is that Nebuchadnezzar has passed off the scene. Historians tell us that his son actually became a king and there were uh, several kings, three or four kings along the way that did not last long before Belshazzar who is actually the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar became the king of Babylon. And so another 20 or 30 years have passed since we last studied Daniel in chapter 4. Now, as you go through chapter 4, you will note that there are times where Nebuchadnezzar is referred to as his father. But remember in ancient times that those who have gone before the children were referred to as fathers. We still today mention about Father Abraham, even though he is many generations past beyond us. And so it is not unusual in ancient times and ancient writings to refer to male members of the family as the father. And so King Belshazzar is now the king. Scholars say that at this point, based on years that they have looked at his life, that Belshazzar is probably around 35 years of age. And so we know from history that Belshazzar was a young man. And the older I get, the more I realize how young 35 years of age really is. And so now he's described in verse 1 as having a great feast for a thousand of his lords, and he drank wine in front of the thousand. And so Belshazzar, here in the great city of Babylon has brought in a large number of friends. And as we read through the chapter, we discover that his wives and concubines are all a part of this party that he's putting on. They're drinking, they're partying as if it's 1999. And so they're having this big party. And the Bible says that, verse 2, Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple of Jerusalem. Remember that? We studied earlier that when the Babylonians went in and captured the people in Judah, that they took out the prized possessions that were in the temple there in Jerusalem. These are the vessels that had been dedicated and committed to God. They were committed to God. They were given to God. And it was a sacred treasure that Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple and brought to Babylon. But he had them stored. And now that his grandson Belshazzar is getting drunk with uh, his party, the Bible says that he ordered that these vessels that had been brought from Jerusalem from the temple be brought so that they could drink out of those vessels. 
And so him and his wives and concubines were going to continue the party by drinking from these sacred vessels that had been brought from the temple. And so he commanded that uh, his wives and lords and concubines drink from them. Now notice in verse 4 how worse it gets. Not only did they bring these vessels from the temple and began to get drunk drinking from them, but the Bible says that as it got worse, they praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And so they had taken the sacred things of God and were getting drunk from these sacred vessels and were now worshiping false idols. They could not be any more blasphemous than what they were doing at this point with the sacred things of God. Now I want you to note something as we look at this passage of Scripture. Remember that they are at this point under siege by the Medes and the Persians. And as we go through the chapter, you're going to discover that while Belshazzar is inside the city of Babylon, and that city was very fortified, it seemed to him to be impossible for anyone to break through the walls of Babylon. There were places, we are told historically, there were places that the walls were over 300 feet high. Those are high walls. But there were places in the walls around the city of Babylon that were as high as over 300 feet. There were also places that the walls were as thick as 87 feet. So they were well fortified. And yet the Medes and the Persians were already set up outside those walls. That's important to note. Because God had already given a vision to Nebuchadnezzar of a great image that stood 90 feet tall. Remember that dream? And no one could interpret that dream because it was a message from God. And God said that this 90 foot tall image that Nebuchadnezzar had built had a head of gold. And this head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar. And God said that from that head of gold was the bronze and silver chest, which we know would be the Medes and the Persians who would overtake Babylon. And God had given to Daniel the prophecy of this event. And yet, not only is Belshazzar sitting here getting drunk, he's totally indifferent to the fact that the Medes and the Persians are on the other side of the city wall attempting to invade him. He doesn't really care. He's indifferent to that. He doesn't think anything can happen to him. Instead of taking caution and precaution and preparing for battle, instead he's having a big party as though nothing could ever happen to him. He could care less about what God had said in the past. He wasn't listening to God. He wasn't paying attention to the things of God. He was just having a big party. And so the Bible goes on to tell us, with that in mind, that here he is getting drunk, and, and yet verse 5 says immediately. Now note this. Note the swiftness of how God is now going to deal with Belshazzar. The Bible says immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. Now note that also Someone that really is not spiritually minded or biblical minded might say, well, he's just drunk. Remember that? Maybe he's just seeing things because he's drunk. I know that I've been around people who were drunk and they saw a lot of weird things. I've seen guys through the years who were drunk and they saw weird things and they said weird things. But listen, this image is not any, has nothing to do with the fact that Belshazzar was getting drunk. This was God speaking to him. And so the Bible says immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and it began to write on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. Opposite the lampstand. Notice the lampstand was also a vessel taken from the temple. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. You can imagine how you would feel if you were sitting around the room and all of a sudden you look over toward the wall and there's a hand and fingers that are writing on the wall. I don't know how you would react, 
I know that it would be a surreal, strange thing to look up and see that writing on the wall. And so as a result of that, the Bible says in verse 6 that the king's color changed. I can imagine. He got real pale looking. He sees this writing on the wall. And the Bible says that his thoughts alarmed him. Understood. The Bible also says that his limbs gave way. He got really nervous and loose and, and, and his knees started knocking together. And so here is, here is this king who was so uh, arrogant and so haughty, who thought nothing could happen to him, who is indifferent to the fact that the Medes and Persians are outside the gates of the city. And the Bible says that at that point, verse 7, he called loud to these enchanters and these wise men and these Chaldeans and astrologers. And he declared to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and shows me the interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now at this point in time, it is our understanding as we study what was going on that the lead ruler was Belshazzar's dad over all of Babylon. Belshazzar was the king over the city of Babylon. And so whoever could interpret this dream would, or this handwriting on the wall would become the third leader in the Babylonian kingdom. Well, the Bible goes on to tell us, and you already guessed it because you've already been studying Daniel, the wise men, astrologers, Chaldeans, they could not interpret the dream. And remember what we said in an earlier message. The wise men, Chaldeans, sorcerers, astrologers, all of these guys that they keep bringing in, got in that position for a reason. And the reason was they were able to tell some, the king through the years some things. But the reason why they were not able to interpret the dreams and the visions and the images that we're reading about in Daniel is because these are messages from God. And remember that the Bible tells us that the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God. And so the reason why they could not make these interpretations was because they were messages from God. He was not seeing this because he was drunk. The astrologers and the magicians and sorcerers could not give him answers because they can't understand spiritual matters. They might be able to read these Aramaic words but they could not interpret what it means. That's the problem. And so he makes this promise that I'll give you something great if you can interpret it. Verse 9, Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. Then, verse 10 says, that the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, he's in panicking, came to the banqueting hall, and the queen declared... O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. Easier said than done at this point. Verse 11 said, there's a man. There is a man. I love that statement. There is a man. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Remember, that's the same phrase that Nebuchadnezzar had used in reference to Daniel. And even though that they're referring to holy gods with a small g, the many gods. Really, we understand that they were seeing something special in Daniel. There was something different about Daniel. He was not like all the others. He was not like the magicians. He was not like the sorcerers or the Chaldeans. There was something different about that man. They couldn't quite put their finger on it or explain it properly, but there was something different about him. I love, there's been a time or two in my life where I've had people that have come to me and said, I don't know what it is, but there's something different about you. There's something different about your life. And it's a thrill to be able to look at them in the eyes and say, it's Jesus. Jesus is the one who has changed my life. Jesus is the one who has changed me. And so they saw something different. And she said, there's a guy here who, who is... Uh, has the wisdom of a God, she says. There's a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, 
Your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers because of his, notice this description of him, excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems that were found in Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Now, note something in verse 13. The Bible says that at this time, Daniel was brought in before Belshazzar. Now, we started with Daniel in chapter 1. Remember that when we started with Daniel, we started when the people of Babylon had, and the armies marched into Judah, and they took the people of Judah captive. And you'll remember from our earlier study that they came in and they took the the people who were very gifted, they took the talented people, the smart people, those who had a lot of skills. They took the young people who seemed to be all talented. And among that group was this young man by the name of Daniel. And so when we started in chapter 1, we found that Daniel was a young teenage boy. But as we've gone through the chapters, we've watched him age. We saw an incident in his 30s uh, when the fiery furnace event took place. We saw an event... Uh, when delivered uh, in the last chapter when he was in his 50s. And now as you add up the years, when Daniel walks into the room to face Belshazzar, he walks in as an 82-year-old man. At the age of 82, he's still around. It's unbelievable to me that Belshazzar had no idea who Daniel was. After all that God had done through the life of Daniel... After all of these events that had taken place when Nebuchadnezzar was the king and Daniel interpreted the dreams and Daniel was able to interpret uh, visions that Nebuchadnezzar had had and how that God had delivered the children of Israel or the children of Judah out of the fiery furnace. And yet Belshazzar didn't have the foggiest idea who this man was. And now Daniel walks in the room at the age of 80 in verse 82 in the verse 13. And by the way, for any of you who may be close to that age, I want to remind you that God is never finished with using you. This man is 82 years old, and he walks into the room. And the Bible says that he was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah. I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now he tells him that none of the others could interpret what had taken place. And so I will not re recount because he, says, he repeats what he had said earlier to the wise men in Chaldeans. And they couldn't do it, he says. So in verse 17, Daniel answered him and said, as he offered Daniel the ability to have this golden necklace and this robe given to him. And Daniel says, I love this statement. Let your gifts be for yourself. Daniel let him know that what he does, he doesn't do for the money. A true prophet of God, a true man of God, does not do anything for money. I am not a hireling. I do not pastor this church for the money. I do not share the gospel with the lost. I do not get paid to share the gospel with the lost. I do not get paid to do what anybody wants me to do. This church does not give to me to pay me to do what I do. The church gives to me to free me up in order to do what God has called me to do. I am not a hireling. And no one tells me what I'm going to preach because I'm not a hireling. No one can say, well, we give this much money to the church, so you've got to say what we want to say. doesn't happen. Because I'm not a hireling. No prophet of God does what he does for the money. And Daniel said you can keep your money. Keep it for yourselves as far as I'm concerned. Because I'm not for sale. And so Daniel goes on to say. Nevertheless I will read the writing to the king. And I will make known to him the interpretation. Now here we go beginning in this next statement in verse 18. Where Daniel goes back over kind of the history of Nebuchadnezzar. And we've already studied this, so we know the events that took place, the way God manifested himself, the way God glorified himself, and the things that Nebuchadnezzar saw. 
and how that God did these amazing things in front of Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream where he saw that 90-foot image I I referred to a minute ago, and, and he was just totally perplexed about this huge image. And nobody could interpret it. And Daniel came in and God gave him the words as to what this meant. You'll remember that he had another vision of a tree and and he couldn't understand what that meant. And God gave to Daniel the answer and he explained to him that he was that tree and God was going to chop him down. He had another experience at the fiery furnace where these young boys were thrown into the fire and they would not bend, they would not bow, they would not burn and they came through the fiery furnace And nothing burned off of them except what man put on them. And that was the ropes they had been tied up with. And so Daniel lets young Belshazzar know what God had done with Nebuchadnezzar for the glory of God. Now I want to to go on down to verse 22. Because here is where he responds and applies it to Belshazzar. He says to him, and you his son... Belshazzar, if not humbled your heart. Now I want to remind you again of the boldness of Daniel. That should be the boldness of every child of God. We do not speak to people rudely or we're not going to be obnoxious to people when we talk to them. But we will speak the truth to a world that we live in. As a child of God, you should never be intimidated by anyone that you're talking to. It doesn't matter if it's the President of the United States. It doesn't matter if it's the Queen of England. It doesn't matter if it's some Prime Minister somewhere. If God speaks to your heart and there's a message that God wants to deliver, you speak what God put upon your heart. Daniel was a bold man. And he stands before the most powerful man in his day. The most powerful person that the Bible even says in this chapter that this man had the ability to have people killed. At just an order, he could have someone killed. And yet Daniel spoke boldly the message from God. You know why? It's because Daniel feared God more than he feared what someone might say or do to him. And whenever you stop fearing what people might say about you, and you fear God more than you do man's opinion. And you fear God more than you do what someone can do to you. And you have more respect. And God is more awesome to you than what someone might say about you or what someone might do. That's the boldness of God's people. And it's a matter of us knowing who God is and being in awe of that. And knowing That we're more concerned about what God knows about us than what anybody might think about us. I cannot tell you how many church members that I have had in churches I've pastored through the years who wanted to just really be obedient to God. And they wanted to serve God and they wanted to be more active in the church. And there were things that they really had been gifted at. But I've seen them through the years who were just afraid to step up and stand up and do what they knew in their heart that they could do and what God wanted them to do because they were afraid of somebody somewhere who might say something about them. I have heard people through the years say things like, well, they might not like, who are they? I don't know who they are, but this they people who I've never met has really hurt a lot of people through the years. And these they people, whoever they are, have kept a lot of people from being obedient to God. And so Daniel was more concerned about obeying God and doing what God wanted him to do than he was uh, in fear of King Belshazzar. And so he just walks in and he tells the man the truth. He said to him, you're his son, Belshazzar, and you have not humbled your heart. And though you knew all of this, you knew what God had done in the life of Belshazzar or, or Nebuchadnezzar. You knew how God had demonstrated himself to your father. You knew all of this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven with a knowledge of what God has done in the past and God's power and God's abilities. You have not listened to God. You have not responded to what God would say to your heart. Oh, how sad it is to note that there are so many people who have heard the testimonies of God's people, 
who have heard the testimony of what God has done in other people's lives. They've heard about changed lives. They've heard about God working miracles in someone's life and family. And yet out of fear of man, of fear of what people would say about them, or just total disregard for God, they did not respond. I think it's sad. Here is Daniel standing before the king who could have had him killed and he could care less because he's going to just speak the truth. And he said, you haven't humbled your heart. You haven't listened to the message that God had for you. And I want to say to everyone who's listening to me right now, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ to be your own personal Lord and Savior, and you're turning away from Him, and you're telling Him perhaps some other day I will do that, Maybe you're even saying that as I'm speaking right now. Maybe some other day. Maybe another time. Maybe when I've sown my wild oats, I will turn to Christ. I want to tell you that doesn't mean the opportunity is going to come. That does not mean that day will happen. You're not listening to God. You've not humbled your heart. Because if you had humbled your heart and listened to God, you would turn to Him right now in repentance of your sin. You would turn to him right now and say, I need you, Jesus, in my heart. I need you more than anything, Jesus, to come into my life and save me and cleanse me and wash me from my sins. I need salvation. Listen, don't let pride send you to hell. Don't let the pride of your heart keep you from doing what God wants you to do. Belshazzar did that and Daniel said, listen, you have not humbled your heart. You're not listening to God. And he goes on to say, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you and you and your lords, your wives, your concubines, you've got, gone and been drinking and getting drunk with these, praising the gods of silver and bronze and gold. And then he goes on to say, but the God in whose hand is your breath. Notice that. You remember that word I mentioned it in the message I preached this morning out of town. You remember when we talked to Ezekiel chapter 37 about the valley of dry bones? And we said that that word, R-U-A-H, Ru'ah, means wind, breath, or spirit. And it's the same word that was used in Genesis when God breathed into man the breath of life. You remember that word now. That's the word he uses here. And he said, listen, you've not been listening to the God who ruah, who breathed life into your hands, into your life. God in whose hand is your breath. God holds the very breath of your life. And I will not breathe one more breath without the grace and mercies of God. I will not breathe another breath if God says that was the last one, that was the last one. And I need to respect that. I need to respect the fact that every breath that I have is God-given breath. God is the one who has breathed life into me. God is the one who has breathed into me. And I must respect that. And if you respect that, my friend, you will change the actions of your life. Because you will know that the reason I'm breathing is because God has given to me the opportunity to breathe. And as soon as God says that's the last one, that's going to be the last one. And Daniel tells the king, you need to respect the fact that the very God who holds your breath in his hand has been speaking to you. And you have not honored him. You have not responded to him. And then verse 24 says that then from his presence the hand was sent and this writing was inscribed. Now let's go to verse 25. Daniel sees the writing on the wall that you read about in verse 25. In verse 25, there are these words, Mina, Mina, Tekel, Parson. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, this is one of those cases where we teach you when you interpret the Bible, is to, one of the first principles of Bible interpretation is to let the Bible interpret itself. And so God interprets that verse for us as we read on. That's why it's so important to read all of these passages in context. So he goes on to interpret it for us. So he says at this point, this is the interpretation. Mina means numbered. God has numbered. Mene, 
the days of your kingdom. Notice that. Remember, he just told him that the God who holds your very breath in his hand has numbered your days. And God knows when that last breath is going to be breathed. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom. Now listen to these strong words. And he's brought it to an end. He's telling him what God has said to you. When you looked at that wall and you saw those words being written on the wall. God has said, this God who holds your very breath in his hand has said, I have numbered your days. I have numbered the days of your kingdom and it's over. It's time for your last breath. I know it's coming to an end. Now he goes on with the second word, to kel, which means weighed. God has counted. He has numbered your days. He's brought it to an end. He has weighed your life. He has weighed you in the balances and found you wanting. You are lacking, Belshazzar. God sees your actions. God sees that you've turned your heart away from Him. God sees you taking His vessels from His holy temple and using them to get drunk on and party. And you've got an army of Medes and Persians outside the wall of your city getting ready to invade this city. And God has already said earlier in Daniel, they're going to win the war. We already know that because we read the first part of Daniel. We know that because we're on the, this side of it and we know that the prophecy came true. And so we know by reading the Word of God that God's prophecy about Him falling comes true. And so He said, you've been weighed and found wanting. Your days are numbered. Now look at this third word. P-E-R-E-S. Peres means divided. And you'll remember that He had already said, as you see in this verse, it is given to the Medes and Persians. So you remember that earlier in Daniel, when he had that initial dream about a 90-foot image with a golden head and bronze and silver, bronze chest, silver arms, and God taught us in the Word of God that those two medals that he was seeing in that image were the Medes and Persians. And they were the ones who would come and take down the Babylonians. And so while he is inside his palace partying, the Medes and Persians are knocking on the door. He thought that they, they could not penetrate that wall. There's a lot of truth in his thought, except they had one problem. One problem was there's a river running right down the middle of the city, the Euphrates River, where they received their waters, and it was unwalled. And Darius, the great warrior of the Medes and Persians, was smart enough to find the weak link in the city of Babylon. And the Bible says that God has given the Medes and Persians. Verse 29 says that then Belshazzar, Belshazzar gave the command, and it's interesting to note as bold as Daniel was in speaking the truth to Belshazzar. Belshazzar went on and gave him the, the clothing with purple, and he gave him the chain of gold and put it around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, at this point, it don't really matter, does it? What difference does it make? They're getting ready to lose. The Medes and Persians are getting ready to come through the wall. They're getting ready to come into the city and take over the kingdom. And we know that. And so verse 30 says, That very night, that very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, about 62 years of age. God's prophecy came true. Now I want you to, to really note a few things about what we've been looking at. After he told him you've been weighed and found wanting, God was going to divide the kingdom among the, P, the Medes and Persians. Principle number one that I want you to remember as we've studied this chapter is that we have to learn from the past. Belshazzar did not. He did not listen to the testimony of what God had done in Nebuchadnezzar. He did not listen to what God was trying to say to his heart. He did not learn from the past. 
And I submit to you that if you're listening to me right now, you have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is this, that you and I have all sinned against God. Every single one of us, anyone listening to me in the auditorium, if you're listening on the radio, if you're listening on the television or on the internet, we have all sinned. We have all come short of the glory of God, every single one of us. Just like Belshazzar, just like Nebuchadnezzar, these ancient pagan kings, you and I too have sinned against God. And it may be that you're like this old ancient king where you're indifferent to God speaking to your heart. I was visiting with a lady this week in our community and she wanted to talk to me about something going on in her life. And she said that her child is in prison. He had murdered someone, numerous drug charges, and was talking to me about her own life. And she said, you know, what frightens me the most is when I was a child, my mother used to say that your heart can get so hard that you'll no longer listen to God. And I said, well, there's two things about that I want you to understand. First of all, you're not there because you're talking to me about the Lord. So obviously you have not gotten there yet. But secondly, it is true that the Bible teaches us that you can so harden your heart that when God speaks to you and the Holy Spirit wants to speak to your heart and make you aware of your lostness and make you aware of your need for Jesus Christ, it is possible that you have so hardened your heart that you don't listen to God and you don't hear Him and you don't even know who it is that's trying to speak to your heart. You don't recognize that as God. That's possible. And you'll note that as we study this chapter, you'll remember that earlier in Daniel, God had given Nebuchadnezzar a year to repent. Remember that? Not so with Belshazzar. And so I want to tell you this. While you may tell me that perhaps someday after I've turned over a new leaf, or maybe someday after I've sown my wild oats, or maybe some other day when I'm not so busy, I may turn to Christ. My friend, listen to me. There may not be another day. I don't say that to be mean. I say it with a broken heart. Because today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time, the Bible says. This is the opportunity you have to be saved. And if you realize that you've disobeyed God, this is the moment to turn to Him in repentance. I don't know that you'll have that time. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar had a year to repent. We read in other places in, in the Bible where people had numerous years to repent. But here Belshazzar did not. He died that night. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to give to you emotional fear. I'm trying to tell you the truth that you need to repent right now. Give your heart to Jesus the second principle I want you to learn from this is that God acts swiftly. God acts swiftly. You notice that when Belshazzar and his family were getting drunk and he had this big party in the palace, the Bible says that he's drinking from these holy vessels brought from the temple and immediately, the Bible says, immediately is when the writing went on the wall. It was immediate. Now God is a very patient God, don't take me wrong. And throughout the Bible, we read of God's patience. We read that God is a patient God. We read that God is a long-suffering God. But we also learn that when God does move, He moves swiftly. And I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to toss a coin on that one. I'm not willing to so be filled with pride that I would say that God's not going to deal with me tonight, maybe some other day. I, I just don't have that kind of pride anymore. I have too much fear of what would happen to me if I was away from God. I need Him. I say that because I know I need Him. And Some of you who do not know Him as your Savior, come to Him right now. Just come on to Jesus right now. Don't put it off. You need Jesus right now. Those of us who are saved, God speaks to our hearts. and Sometimes we put off what God wants to do in our own lives. Don't do that, my friend. God wants to do some things in your life that are phenomenal. There are people that God wants to touch through you. And the more disobedient you are to God, the less opportunity the lost have in our community to be saved. Have you ever thought of that? The more disobedient you are in your life as a believer, 
the less opportunity our community has to come to Christ. Am I holding people up from being saved? You know, this, this is just coming to my heart right now. I hadn't planned to say this. God's just speaking to my own heart right now. Is there something in my life that is perhaps holding someone else up from being saved? Am I in some area of my life being disobedient to God where if I was being obedient in that area, maybe God would use that to touch someone's life? What is going on? I want to repent, God. And I want to ask you to join with me in prayer tonight. As we get close to our time of invitation, you can go ahead and start praying if you want to. I don't care. You can come up here and get on your knees. I'm going to preach just a few minutes longer. But if you feel the need, don't wait for me to stop preaching. If you feel the need to just get on your face before God, just get up and get on your face before God. I, don't wait till I'm done. Get before Him right now. Remember that God acts swiftly, so turn to Him now. The third principle I want you to see is to be prepared for the future. How can I be prepared for the future? It's that simple. By obedience. It's a complete, total obedience to God. That's how I can be prepared for my future. And Paul said, I'm ready to be offered in Timothy. How is it that Paul could say he was ready to die? It's because he was obedient to God. He was doing what God wanted him to do. He was walking in obedience. I've told you the story many times, but I, I think about it sometimes in my own life. Story of one time when my dad was a pastor. He went to see a man in the hospital. The guy was just in total anguish. My dad tried to reassure him and comfort him by telling him that even if he went on to heaven that he would be in the presence of Jesus and that he did not need to fear death. The man grabbed him by the shirt and was jerking him around. The man said, you don't understand, Pastor. I'm not afraid to die. I'm embarrassed to die. I'm embarrassed to face Jesus with the way that I've lived my life. i got to tell you, and Ter Carol will tell you, because sometimes I'm a little bit too transparent with you. I know that. Most churches don't like pastors who are transparent. Most, pastors like pa uh, most churches like pastors who live in the clouds, you know, and they never have failures or do anything wrong. But I, I'm transparent with you to a fault. But i got to tell you, sometimes I'm embarrassed at the thought of going to heaven. I'm embarrassed about it. To think about my life and my failures, to think about the times of disobedience in my own life, I, I'm embarrassed before my Lord some of the things I've done. And I do know that the Bible tells me that God does not see that. I understand that. I understand that the Bible says that my sin has been taken away as far as the east is from the west. I understand that. But there's times where I'm embarrassed as a Christian. At my own life. I hear about believers around the world giving their lives for Christ, and I'm embarrassed if I'm ever timid about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't want to be that way. I want to be an obedient follower of Jesus Christ. Don't let anything stop you from that. If you want to enjoy your Christian life, you want to have life in your living, just obey Him. Don't worry about what somebody else said. Oh, there's some smart aleck out here somewhere that'll say something about you. Call you goody two-shoes. Or they'll tell you, why do you want to give all of your time to the Lord? And why do you run up there to the church three or four times a week when you could stay at home and watch ball games? And say, You know, why do you do that? Why don't you just go run around the community? Why don't you go down the lake every Sunday instead of going to church and ride a boat around the lake? instead of going to church. Why don't you do those things? There, there's smart aleks out here that say that kind of stuff. But I want to tell you this. I, I don't begrudge people that enjoy life. But let me tell you this. I do not begrudge serving Jesus and loving Him and walking with Him and crying out to Him in prayer and getting with you guys right here at this church and singing about Him and us loving each other like a family and welcoming each other. You couldn't give me enough money on planet Earth to trade that. I love being a follower of Jesus. I love walking in obedience with Him. I love being a part of the church of Jesus Christ. I love it. And I'm glad I'm a part of the family of God. I do not begrudge that. And I want to walk in obedience. How about you? Why don't we all just make that kind of commitment that says Jesus I don't want to be like Belshazzar. I don't want to take things for granted. I don't want to be indifferent. I don't want to not care. 
I really want to be obedient and do what God wants me to do. We're going to stand in just a moment and sing. Before we sing our song of invitation, I want to ask you one question about your life. What is it in my life that God's, God approves? What is it in my life that brings God's approval? What does God see in me that brings his approval? You already know the answer, don't you? It's Jesus. When God looks at me, what brings the approval of God upon my life is the presence of Jesus. It's not what I have done. It's not me being perfect. It's not my works that brings God's approval. It's not me being a good old boy that brings God's approval. When God looks at me, what brings the approval of God upon my life is when he sees Jesus. Do you know what brings the approval of God upon our church? Is when God looks at this church and he sees Jesus in us. Do you know what brings God's approval upon your speech and the things you say and the actions of your life? It's when he looks at it and he sees the works of Jesus in you and he hears Jesus speaking through you. That is God's approval upon our life. And while we're running in circles and living this burdensome life, trying to work out everything and trying to do our best and trying to be good boys and girls and trying to do our best to go to heaven, what brings God's approval is not us running around doing those things. It's when he looks at us and sees Jesus. That's what brings the approval of God into my life. Do you know Jesus? Is Jesus in your life if he's not come to him right now? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, our hearts cry out to you to know you. To know you, Father, and your will for our lives. Let us be obedient. Not indifferent. Let us not have hard hearts. Let us not say some other day. Father, I pray that right now we will walk in obedience to you. And that you would look and see Jesus in us. Oh, Jesus, be Jesus in me. No longer me, but the resurrection power fill me this hour. Jesus, be Jesus in me. I pray in your precious name. Amen. Thanks for being with us today uh, with the broadcast of our service here at Tate's Creek Baptist Church. You're always welcome to join us in our auditorium each Sunday. We have services at both 11 a.m. as well as 6 p.m., we have prayer meeting on Wednesday nights at 6.30 where we join together and pray for one another. And we would love to have you with us. Bring your children, bring your families, and we'll be glad to see you.